Hello there. I am Julie Hirschberg, the owner of Reactive Physical Therapy and Wellness. And in Reactive, it is our mission, it is our passion to help people with neurologic disorders recover movement, strength, confidence, and do this through brain th changing therapy and exercise. And a big part of this, um, uh, the way we really look to impact people is through um, education and sharing, sharing our love of all things neuro. Um, but in particular, sharing some of the things that we are learning and doing here as a group. We have an amazing group of physical therapists and we have the Schmidt Movement Disorder Fellowship and as part of that, we do mini courses just about every six weeks. And one of those, which is the next week, is on Camp Decormia. And um, I'm, I, I get really excited about this topic because it is such a challenge. And um, I hear from a lot of people that it's really challenging to kind of understand what's the underlying pieces contributing to it and to, to treat it. So um, great, thank you all for joining today. Um, it's also a really fun day. It happens to be my um, anniversary with my husband, 22 years married and um, you know, he is such a big supporter of Reactive, of me. Um, he really puts up with the neural love. Um, and uh, we get to share a lot uh, together. Um, and so it's kind of fun to be doing this Facebook Live on our anniversary. Um, and um, we're, we're going to dive right in. So um we're just doing a little piece today so that it's really an understanding the chemtocormia problem is it dystonia and this is really just one small part of the mini course that we're doing next thursday evening so which if you can join us live for that course but we'll also have it recorded and this is one of those pieces that really drives my neuro curiosity, I guess you would say. Um, it's that understanding the underlying mechanism because I really feel like if I can't get that, I can't treat it really effectively. So um, that is what we're diving into today. What is the mechanism in particular? How do we know if it might be dystonia? So let's dive in. Um, and, you know, I should start off by first briefly describing what is camptochormia. It's not like a, I don't know, it's a word we throw out all the time around here, but it's not something that everyone throws out around. Um, but by definition, camptochormia is diagnosed when, when somebody's leaning forward, so trunk flexion greater than 45 degrees. Typically, this is in standing because part of the definition is that it reverses if you have support or you're in sitting or you're lying down. Something else that you might hear and it's actually a little bit different and it's called PISA syndrome, like the leaning tower of PISA, this is defined as a pronounced lateral flexion of greater than 10 degrees while standing that also reverses. So we're not talking about scoliosis, which doesn't reverse, but we're talking about something that changes with positions and posture. So right away that gets me going like neuro curious, like what is going on? Why does that happen? What is it about gravity? What is it about the postural writing responses? All of those things. Now, be, this is part of our movement disorders fellowship because you can see this in Parkinson's. And that's really what we're gonna focus on. Certainly you can see it with spinal disorders or um, muscular dystrophies even, but we're, we're talking in particular about movement disorders. So what are some of those possible mechanisms? And the, the literature is kind of all over the place, um, but there is some evidence, and this is certainly my clinical experience. I think what we see in the clinic here is that it seems to be really multifactorial, um, but important things that, in in addition to understanding the dystonia part, important things to really investigate are changes in medication. So this has come out in the literature, several case studies with a change or addition of a different Parkinsonian medication with, with the onset, and then they take away that medication and it's gone. So 
brilliant, like that would be the first thing to scream because it has, uh, that has actually not happened to me, but certainly I would be like singing praises if that were the case because that would be a wonderful way to get rid of your Kempt Cormia. So checking with the changes in medications. Uh, myopathy, spinal cord disease, so this is in addition to, to, um, to Parkinson's. And, you know, the question that we really want to get to today, is it a dystonia? Is it Parkinson dystonia? And there are really four main areas that I think about to myself, try to understand this and, and work in collaboration with a neurologist to really get underneath this. And the first piece um, is something, it's part of the definition of dystonia, something I always look for is does it respond to a sensory cue? So for example, um, I have a woman who um, actually has a combination of the camp decormia, the forward flexion and the PISA syndrome. And, and it's often that those go hand in hand. And she could, gosh, I guess I can't really get this on the video, but she could basically put her hand here at her ribs and, and she could decrease that almost completely. And it wasn't a physical movement. It was a light touch of her ribs and the camptocornea was gone. So that would be an example of a sensory cue. I think we see it in the cervical dystonias, um, the other dystonias really frequently, but you want to test and see, does it respond to some sort of sensory cue? And that would be a hint that it is dystonia. Um, the second and hugely important, and I try to make this a part of all of the evaluations uh, that I do with Camptocormia, is to look at the muscle activity, in particular using surface EMG if you have it. Now, we haven't always had surface EMG. There are some lower cost alternatives for this now, and I'll, I'll put a link in the comments here with a group that had newer version out that's pretty low cost. I think most clinics can, can get it. I can't remember the exact cost, but maybe around $400. Um, but a pretty simple way to put surface EMG on different muscles. What muscles might you look for? Now, in the literature, some of the things that have been repeatedly shown are actually ac activation of the oblique muscles, quadratus lumborum, especially with some of the side bending, um, paraspinals with the side bending, so a unilateral paraspinals, um, even rectus. So we might look at all aspects of that to see if there truly is, especially if there's that shift so that it is more asymmetrical because it's hard, hard to know. Like I, I am not um, a person that does EMG every day. So to, to look at compared to norms, what I'm really looking for is asymmetries uh, from side to side. So that is really one nice way to look at it. Um, the conjunction of that is so is, is one side overactive um, more than normal or like constantly on. And often the patient is describing like, okay, I feel this pulling forward, I feel my muscles on, and then you can look and see with the surface EMG, are they on? Is that just the sensation that they're feeling? Um, and what you can also do then, which I find really helpful, is put it on the muscles that really seem to not be working. So those paraspinal muscles, if they're really forward flexed, are those muscles on at all? Um, and, you know, we've had a few cases, even just recently, where we put them on the paraspinals and we're not getting any activity or only a little bit of activity on one side. And so that might be a cue not to dystonia, um, unless those muscles are being inhibited, um, but possibly to an underlying myopathy, um, myelopathy. So um, it's really helpful to have the surface EMG. But you know what? If not, like, Use your hand. So yesterday, I was actually um, co-treating with Claire. Shout out to Claire, our amazing movement disorders fellow right now. I was doing a session with her, um, with a gentleman who had camped cornea, and he had just fallen that morning. And so the session became a little bit more about like, okay, it looks like you have a separated shoulder. I think you need a wrist x-ray. Um, but in the, in the meantime, 
you know, we don't, we didn't have the surface EMG with us. And I was just like, let's just feel here because even in sitting, he was starting to get a really strong lean. And so I just had my hands on his abdominals, on the, on the quadratus, really just trying to get a good picture of if there's something um, activating and really pulling him. I didn't get a sense of that with him um, at all, but I did get a very strong sense that he had no idea that he was being strongly tilting to the right. And I think, right, like, I think if I had asked most of the therapists here, that would be the thing, right, that, that people don't notice. Um, and don't have that sense. And so why, why is that, right? Um, so that's where we'd wanna know, is, is that um, dystonia? Is the dystonia caused by this lack of body awareness, proprioception, maybe vestibular um, piece? Because we know the cervical dystonia might be driven by that. Even focal dystonia might be driven by that. So could a trunk dystonia in Parkinson's be driven by proprioceptive deficits, um, postural writing response deficits? So that would be the next piece to look at is are, are those an underlying contribution to a muscle imbalance, muscle overactivity, um, involuntary muscle contractions. Um, so looking at things perhaps with eyes closed, um, just asking like we did um, yesterday, Claire and I like, do you feel yourself over to the right side. Um, and, and, and that's probably super obvious and simple, um, but that's a good way to know about that overall um, body awareness. And then finally, so I said fourth thing, the fourth thing would be more of this collaboration with a neurologist, but a response to Botox. So um, this has been part of the literature, some really small studies looking at response to Botox in Camptochormia with mixed results. So I think this is very patient specific and it requires an underlying analysis to see that there truly are muscle, most muscle overactivities. Um, and I'm really curious from the, the crew watching if you've had somebody treated with Botox for Camptochormia or PISA syndrome, I'm really curious. So if you have, put that in the comments. I would, I'd love to hear that from you and hear your perspective. Have you had it? Has it, have you seen success with it? Um, in the literature, there are a few cases in small trials. Um, I've seen it twice in my practice where somebody's been treated. And in both cases, it wasn't helpful in their posture. And in fact, it ended up giving them a little more back pain, which you can imagine if you denervate the abdominal muscles that you could have some back pain. So um, I think this is a very, very tricky piece. However, because there are some really great case studies showing a very marked benefit, I think it's worth exploring with a with a movement disorder neurologist who's really skilled and um, understands this piece. Um, and I'm just um, catching the uh, the comments here, but Saida had said um, my patients in the in the past did not receive Botox for camptochormia. I, I don't think it's very um, common, but I would say if I tested a patient, I'm thinking of this gentleman yesterday, and he, if he had really palpable overactivity and we put the surface EMG on and it's really, really active, it might be it might be worth a try um and we work with a great movement disorder neurologist alan Wu, and his crew at ucla um and several other movement disorders neurologists who have a great back and forth with us to um to help make that decision and determine if it's successful so i think you just hold that idea in mind that you might make somebody more weak which can be really problematic um, so, okay, so what did we just talk about that? Because that was a, a whirlwind um, for me. So what we're trying to understand is can camptochormia be dystonia? And it certainly can. Um, 
how we would know is not an exact science. So we can palpate, we can use surface EMG, we can look for a sensory cue, we can collaborate with a movement disorder neurologist to see how they respond to targeted treatment. And it's like putting all of those pieces together, I feel like helps the understanding. Um, but I still feel like it's just a tiny piece of the puzzle. So if you do find that it's dystonia, it probably also has these other things like how long has this been happening is there also weakness in the back because of this is was this driven by some vestibular or postural writing response uh, deficits so lots of other pieces that can contribute to that so getting down underneath those is important as well um which is why this is one of our mini courses as part of the um, fellowship is to dive into all of those pieces because it's complicated and um, it can be so challenging to treat because of that. If it was just one of those things, that's challenging enough. But in my experience, it's been multiple of those things happening at once. And that really requires a lot of therapy, maybe a pretty intensive bout of therapy, which is what we'll talk in our mini course. When you look at the research, that is really what it's showing. When we look at our clinical experience, that seems to be what it takes to make some changes for people. Um, so, and that's part of the interest and um, like curiosity. That's what sparks my curiosity and passion about it is, trying to understand and, and figure that out, tease it out. So um, if you're wanting more, more discussion, more resources, more patient cases, join us for our mini course next week. Um, and if you can't make it, it's next Thursday in the evening. Come join us in person if you want to join us for one of our fun potlucks and be with us in person or join us online. We do it on Zoom. Um, I think as of yesterday, we had about five more slots for that. Um, and then it's gonna be recorded, so available anytime. Um, we'd love to have you, I'd love to hear your patient cases um, and learn and discover together. Um, and, um, you know, if you're here today as well, I would love to hear from you what has worked, what has been challenging. If you are a person with camptochormia, I'd like to hear those things too. Sometimes people have had some really great response um, from something as simple as changing their diet and their gut health because it meant their medications were better absorbed. This is something Claire and I actually talked about yesterday with her patients. So I'd love to hear that. Um, I'd love to hear those little jewels from uh, you all. And uh, next week, same time, same place, so Friday, 12:30 Pacific time. We're going to jump in here again for a little recap after our mini course because I always gain so much from the discussion that we have, and I'll be sharing that next week. I will also pop in here in the comment section a couple of resources, great articles. Um, I'll pop in one that is um, available, open access, that is a really nice review of um, Camptochormia um, as well. So thanks so much for joining me today. This is a lovely Friday in Southern California, and I will check catch you next week.